Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. We've got a new mini PC to check out today. This one on the higher end of the spectrum. This is the GMK Tech Evo T1. It's a little bit larger than some of the mini PCs we typically look at here in size, but it's got a lot of horsepower with an Intel Core Ultra 9, and it actually does pretty well cooling itself off with the larger case size here. And in this video, we're gonna take a look at what this mini PC is all about and what it can do. And before we get into this, I do wanna let you know in the interest of full disclosure that GMK Tech provided this to the channel free of charge. However, they did not review or approve what you're about to see before it was uploaded. No other compensation was received and all opinions are my own. So let's get into it now and see what this mini PC is all about. Now the price point on this as configured is $999 on the GMK Tech website at the moment. It looks like they're running some kind of promotion and that will include the computer along with 64 gigs of DDR5 RAM. Uh, it's DDR5 5600 and a one terabyte NVMe drive. There's also a bare bones version for 899, although at this moment, the 64 gig one terabyte version is definitely the better value. If you buy this on Amazon, I would make sure you look for a coupon link before you check out. They typically list it at a higher price and then give you a coupon to get it to the price that they usually sell it for direct on their website. So just be on the lookout for that. Now, as I mentioned, this has an Intel Core Ultra 9 processor, and this one is the Ultra 9 285H. It has 16 cores on board. That means it's got six performance cores. It has eight efficiency cores and two low power cores to give you that 16. And as you'll see in a little bit, the CPU performance on this is quite good. It also has Intel Arc graphics built in too, and we'll test out its gaming functionality and its AI functionality a little bit later in the video here. Now, a little bit earlier, I did take it apart to take a look at its upgrade ability. What you have to do is remove the uh, feet on the bottom there, and once you do that, you unscrew the sides, and then everything kind of lifts up here, and you've got that big fan, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And what you'll see inside is your upgradable RAM. I'm pretty sure you can get this up to 128 gigs if you want. But also of note, there are three NVMe slots. These are 4X PCI Express 4 slots. So you do have the ability to add more storage or some other things if you wanna mess around with that. Now the case on this one does feel a little more plasticky and hollow versus some of the other GMK techs that I've looked at that felt better built. And I think it's a result of the cooling system here that needs more room for its vapor chamber. So this black section here is plastic but this section here, the gold part, is metal. It doesn't feel bad, it just feels a little more hollow than some of the other ones that I have looked at recently. Now on the front here, you've got three USB-A ports. These are 3.2 ports running at 10 gigabits per second each. You have a USB Type-C port here in the front. This is also USB 3.2, not USB 4, but this does support display output. So this will actually drive four different displays simultaneously. More on that in a minute. Here you've got a headphone jack. And then if we go look at the back here, you can see the rest of the ports. So on the right side here, we've got two ethernet jacks. These are uh, 2.5 gigabit per second Realtek controllers. And a little bit earlier, I did test out the ethernet performance on these and saw that I was getting what I expected out of them through my ISP here. So we were getting uh, the full 2.3 uh, that you expect out of one of these ports that accounts for the overhead, of course, as well. It also has Intel Wi-Fi on board and the Wi-Fi speed was pretty good. This is Wi-Fi 6 only, so it's not Wi-Fi 7. It did drop off a little bit midstream, but caught itself back up here again. My access point is right here in the room with me and maybe something hit it along with the computer when it was running its test. But I was getting about six to 700 megabits per second on the downstream and over a gigabit on the upstream. So all in, the networking feels pretty good on this one. Here you've got two USB 2.0 ports. This is where I would suggest you plug in your keyboards and mice as I have done here. And then we've got our display outputs, HDMI and display ports. So again, you've got the one in the front that you can use along with these two. And then you've got a 40 gigabit per second USB 4 port. This doubles as a Thunderbolt port. So you can use Thunderbolt devices but you can also run display out of that as well. So you can get your four by using these three plus the one in the front. And then you've got an Oculink port here. We've covered Oculink before. This is essentially a way to connect into the system bus without a lot of overhead. Uh, so you can get GPUs. We've done some tests with Oculink GPUs in the past. 
but you can also get these adapters that allow you to plug desktop cards right into your system like you would on a bigger desktop computer if you wanted to. It gets a little clunky after a while, but you can do it, and it's kind of fun for doing video production and other things where you need that access to the system bus for video capture boards and stuff. So that works out really well here, and you got that port there on the back. Definitely see my videos about Oculink to learn more about it. You've got another headphone jack here, and this is where your power adapter goes. Now, it comes with a 150-watt power supply. It is very small here, so it must be one of those GAN uh, power supplies. So not all that large, but it is separate from the unit itself, which is not unusual for many PCs. Now, the TDP on this is adjustable through the BIOS. Now, out of the box, this was not configured for the best performance. It was in its balanced mode, which is a 54-watt mode. If you hit the escape key and go into the BIOS, you can change the power mode to performance. And when you do that, it will be running at a 70 watt mode, which will get a lot more performance out of this processor. I haven't seen any penalty for doing this. I have definitely worked the system pretty hard over the course of my testing. So there's no reason not to enable it because you will not get the best performance unless you turn it on. And that, again, is not on by default. So remember, go into the BIOS and hit that performance button to get going. One last thing to talk about here is this little button here at the top called fan mode. This doesn't actually adjust the fan. It just adjusts the color of a little LED light that's underneath the metal portion of the casing here. It's not very visible when you are in a well-lit room, but there is a little light under there and you can change what it looks like by pushing the button. But this doesn't impact the system mode or performance. GMK Tech tells me it is just a button to change the light on the top. So with all that out of the way, why don't we fire it up now and see how it performs. All right, so we are up and running right now and we've got things running at 4K60 here. And like other GMK Tech mini PCs, this does ship with a fully activated version of Windows 11 Pro out of the box. And of course, with all those extra NVMe slots, you can dual boot operating systems by putting different ones on each drive for simplicity. So it's nice to see all of that. From a performance standpoint, doing the basics here, this machine performs exactly as you would expect. It is super fast, as you can see here, going to uh, NASA's website. Everything just flies open, which is what you would expect out of a 16-core processor here. So if you're doing basic work, like word processing and other things, this is probably overkill. Um, but it's definitely a nice desktop PC. They also give you a Visa mount in the box if you want to put this on the back of a monitor because it is quite large. A little bit earlier, we also took a look at some YouTube on here. We were doing a 4K60 video from my YouTube channel. We did have one drop frame when it started, but it was otherwise playing things back without any issue whatsoever. These Intel chips are very good at video decoding and encoding at this point, so I would expect no issues using this as a media playback device or a media server. Uh, one thing to note though is that I don't recommend mini PCs as home theater PCs because of HDR compatibility, but for a lot of other things they make a lot of sense. And this would be a great uh, emulation box to maybe plug into a television. But again, for media playback, uh, because of the HDR issues like Dolby Vision compatibility, these things are still not great for that. On the browserbench.org speedometer benchmark test, we got a score of 35.5. This puts it right uh, where I would expect it to be versus some of the other computers we've looked at recently. Of note though, the Mac Mini M4 does edge out a little bit in that browser benchmark. So the Mac Mini, uh, I think, is still probably the best value mini PC out there, especially given how efficient and powerful its chip is. But from an Intel perspective, this thing, running Windows, uh, this thing is certainly capable. And as we work our way through some other examples, you'll see just how capable it is. Why don't we take a look now at AI, uh, because they do have a pack-in app for that. Let's have a look. Now, I was a little apprehensive when I first booted this machine up, because all of the other GMK Tech mini PCs I have reviewed in the past are clean slates. They don't have any extra software on there that Microsoft doesn't include with Windows. This one, though, had an icon over here called AIPC. And when I clicked on it on your behalf, when the machine was off the network, it loaded up this GMK Tech AI application. Now, I did not log in with it. I clicked on the offline mode here. And what this does is it loads up a version of DeepSeek, which is a Chinese AI model. 
but that model is running or loading at the moment uh, locally on your hardware. Now you could get this through an application called Olama, which is an open source application that I've talked about here on the channel in the past. That would be my preferred way to go about doing local AI with this machine. But the one advantage of the GMK Tech app here is that the model will run in the GPU on this Intel hardware versus the CPU that I found Olama running the same model in. So there's maybe a little bit of an advantage to using this until Olama gets easier to work with on Intel GPUs. But uh, again, I'm a little apprehensive about it because I don't know what other things this application is doing. But nonetheless, the model will load up. What it does by default is give you the uh, 32 billion parameter model that consumes about 20 gigabytes of RAM. These things have to run in RAM. And what I'll do here is ask it a quick question here. Let's see if it knows anything about me. Um, the host of lon.tv. Let's see if it makes something up here. And what you'll notice is that the GPU thing right over here is going to take on a bulk of the work in providing this information to me. So right now we're running that GPU at 100%. You can see that the first thing that DeepSeek does, because this is one of those reasoning models, is it tries to figure out what we're asking it, and then it will execute its request based on that. Um, so this will chew on this for a little bit and then start working on it. Now, this is a way also to give it a document and have it do a summary. And you can see how fast it's able to generate the output here. So it's not as fast as it would be if you were using ChatGPT or something online, but because you've got all this RAM, you can load a pretty decent sized uh, language model into memory and execute it that way. And again, you could use Olama for this as well. So pretty cool stuff. Of course, it says I work for ABC News, which I didn't. <laughs> I've never been on Good Morning America before, but <laughs> you get the idea. Uh, you can do local AI on this thanks to the fact that you've got as much RAM as you have. Now, I did load up a similar model using Olama, which uses the CPU versus the GPU. It ran just fine. It has plenty of RAM to work with, but uh, the output was a lot slower. So there you go. That is uh, chat GPT-like functionality running locally on the hardware. And again, I am a little apprehensive about this application being installed when I first got things up and running. I did run a number of malware scans on this with all the popular tools, including the Microsoft Malicious Software Removal Tool. None of those found anything of concern. But again, this has software preloaded where other GMK Tech mini PCs have not had anything preloaded out of the box. I also tried some video editing on this using DaVinci Resolve at 4K60, and I found it was able to do simple transitions here very nicely, very smoothly, all uh, in real time here. So for basic video editing, the kind of video editing that I do here on my channel, uh, without a GPU attached, this will certainly do a nice job. I did give it a slightly more difficult problem to work on, which was adding some video effects to a 4K60 clip. And this did choke it a little bit more uh, than it did on the other example here. So that's where having an external GPU comes into play a little more effectively. But uh, for basic video editing, I think this will work just fine. And I also ran some games on it, of course. This is No Man's Sky running at 1080p at the lowest settings. And my performance here was about 45 to 60 frames per second, depending on what was going on in the world. I did notice there were some lag hits here and there, like right there. And I think part of that had to do with the fact that the shaders on this game sometimes get loaded in real time as you're playing. So there was a little bit of an initial lag that got better over time. And generally I was getting about 45 to 60 frames per second, again at 1080p at the lowest setting. So definitely a playable experience here. So that was good. And then I also tried out Cyberpunk, and this one I ran at 1080p, also at the lowest settings. And I like to run the benchmark in Cyberpunk because it looks at a bunch of different environments. So here you can see we were getting about 45 to 50 frames per second, and that was generally what I would see out of this across uh, different environments and, of course, actually playing the game as well. So a playable experience, not a 60 frames per second experience, but one thing to note here is that unlike some of these other mini PCs with Oculink ports, you've got a lot of CPU power at your disposal. So this is where you might see a little more benefit from an external GPU on this machine versus a less powerful one. Because if you have a CPU bottleneck, you'll have less of a CPU bottleneck here and your GPU might be able to provide you with more performance. But still, out of the box for a mini PC, it looks and plays pretty nicely here. And on the 3D Mark Time Spy benchmark test, we got a score of 4,180. 
And graphically, this is pretty close to some of the other Core Ultra chips from this generation, but check out the CPU performance. We're running like double what I got out of a Core Ultra 7 in that Asus Expert book there at the top. So this is a very nicely performing CPU, and I'm sure you can find a lot of tasks that this mini PC might be well suited for given that CPU performance. Now, as far as its thermal performance is concerned, we did run the 3D Mark stress test. There we got a score of 99.7%. So even with the performance mode enabled, I did not see any reduction in performance over time. It's able to effectively cool itself, and that's thanks to the larger case here and its large fan. Now, as far as power consumption is concerned, under load, really killing it. I was seeing about 90 watts of power usage sitting idle about 12 to 15. Windows is always doing something in the background that drives those numbers up and down, but 12 to 15 was about where it was idling. So if you're looking at this for a home server project, it might uh, do pretty well at that. Gives you the power when you need it, and then it can dial things back when you don't. Now the fan on this, as you saw earlier, is rather large, and it's also a lot quieter because it is larger. So right now it's sitting idle, that fan is running because I'm in performance mode. It's going to continually run the fan, but it's very subdued. But even under load, it's not as loud as some of the smaller mini PCs are that have those small fans that run at a much higher RPM. So even playing a game or doing video editing or AI or whatever, uh, that fan will be heard, but it's definitely not as audible as a lot of other mini PCs are. So as far as high performing mini PCs are concerned, it's probably got one of the quieter fans that I have tested. All right, one last thing to take a look at, and that is its Linux performance. I booted up the most recent version of Ubuntu. Everything ran very well as expected there. However, the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth were not detected, and that surprised me because this has an Intel uh, AX201 chipset. So I don't know if there's just some issue with that particular driver and this version of Ubuntu, but it was not picked up and it's worth mentioning here. But if you were looking to uh, run this as a server, kind of like a little NAS environment with Unraid or something similar, this will work well. I had no issues uh, doing anything else on the Linux side with this. And again, having all those extra NVMe slots in here gives you a lot of different options for uh, booting one of these things up. So this might be a good little home server just because you've got enough capacity to run a language model if some of your self-hosted apps need to use one and it's also not all that power consuming when it is idle. So all in, I found this to be a nicely performing mini PC. It is of course on the more expensive side, but even with its higher price, I do think they packed a lot of value in here. And if you're an enthusiast looking for something powerful to tinker with in a home lab environment, this would be a very fun machine to play with. That will do it for this one. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching.